Um, we next we asked um, each of the panelists to share what with us what keeps them awake at night. And um, I know Cliff, when you and I were talking, you were talking about it's impossible to get still awake. So yeah, I I think that. Um, it's not a shock to know that we're experiencing a huge shift in our working population throughout the United States uh, right now. Both small and large companies are starting to really feel the effects of the retirement of the, of the baby boom generation and what the void is that's being created in any business, manufacturing or any kind of service business, you know, it, you, we're feeling the void throughout uh, industry. And um, so falls from company is no different than any other business right now. Uh, we have a large number of our employees that are approaching or even at retirement age right now and have chosen to work uh, past retirement age. And, and so what keeps me up at night really is our skilled labor because I, I don't think we're unique in the fact that some of the things that our employees do, you just can't teach by reading a, a procedure. You can't teach by looking at a book. Some of it is just passed on as you know knowledge that my sheet metal mechanics, my assemblers, my painters have gotten over the years that they've worked at the company. And you know it's it's very difficult to capture some of these little tricks and techniques. Um, and we talked earlier I, you know, about the certifications in welding we have, and, and Tim deals with welding certification, has welders. I'm not sure my welders could work in his company, and maybe his welders would have trouble working in my company because our products are slightly different, the way we go about manufacturing things are slightly different. And, and I also think corporate culture, each company has a slightly different culture, and, and those things are important into developing a skilled workforce and a skilled labor pool within each of our companies. Um, now here in New Jersey, um, Bob and I have been working for a couple of years now on um, helping to create opportunities for uh, individuals to get some of that skills and really trying to uh, bring together a lot of the different resources, whether it's the uh, the county colleges, the Votech schools, NJIT, the Department of Labor, who's kind of the pocketbook for a lot of this stuff. And, um, you know, see if there are ways, you know, through the network of New Jersey Business and Industry Association that we can create opportunities for individuals to get the skills that will allow them to be successful employees at companies like Bob's and Wallstrom Company. Um, and, and, you know, so New Jersey is actually starting to get it a little bit. And we'll talk about this, I think, in a little bit. But, um, you know, what we have been able to draw upon for our skilled labor, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago, was the fact that there were larger numbers of manufacturers, larger number of employees working in manufacturing. So if someone wanted to make a career change or change a corporation, there was an opportunity for them to do that. Now with corporations uh, leaning out, getting a little bit smaller, a number of manufacturing companies leaving the state, that pool of individuals um, that would be available uh, is shrinking. Combined with the retirement of the baby boom population, it really is creating a critical shortage um, for skilled labor, which is almost, uh, you know, um, hard to believe considering the high unemployment rate that we have. But what we're finding really is that those individuals that are unemployed don't have the skills that we're looking for. So um, it keeps me awake, awake at night thinking about how I'm going to replace my employees who may choose to retire in the next five, ten years. What I do know is that, number one, we can take advantage of some of the resources that the state of New Jersey is putting together through some training programs, through really looking at um, what a great resource the county colleges are. They really are a undiscovered gem if you, if you don't know about it. You know, there are 19 county colleges in the state of New Jersey. Um, all of them have you know, very technically oriented training programs. Each of them ha may have some, some speci specific areas of focus, but um, they're, they're really an untapped resource 
that I think um, will help buffer some of the effects of this, this brain drain that we're gonna experience. Um, but uh, it is something that, and, and it's, whether it's Wallstrom Company as a manufacturer or um, any industry, I know that skilled labor is really a challenge going forward and, and I'm hopeful that some of the things we're doing, at least in the manufacturing niche at the state level, will help mitigate the problems of skilled labor. But um, it, it is a challenge and um, we have to do a lot of it training and training internally because we can't find employees on the outside. And uh, another area that we tend to focus on that I won't get into in depth, but is, is, is job readiness. You know, are the young folks coming in to the workforce right now really prepared to get to work on time and realize that, you know, you kind of got to work eight hours a day. <laughs> so I can tell by the laughs that, that uh, folks have experienced some of this too. So besides the technical skills, we also have, um, I think, some job readiness issues too. Good, I'm sure with your hip-hop expertise, you're probably helps to get home. You ever want to see that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the next, next panel. Next panel. And Bob, I was pleased to learn, received a CPIM, actually three years earlier than I did, in 1978, so um, I thought I was one of the early ones, but you beat me too. So. Um, we talked about operational excellence and how important it is for national manufacturing. Do you want to share? Sure. Uh, and, and like Cliff, it is what keeps you up at night. I haven't slept since April <laughs> 2012. <laughs> uh, it's all about excellence. The uh, customers expect it right from the get-go, from the way you enter an order, uh, respond to a quote, address them first. First impressions are only once. Uh, it has to be right up out of the box. It has to be top shelf and it's all about the people. Uh, and, and when you get in front of a customer, and you know, I mean, my customers are no different than your customers, right? I mean, we have all the same problems. It, they're just called something different. You know nothing about what I do. I know everything about what you do. But, but customers are the same, right? And they expect the call to be answered. They don't want a call back. No callbacks. So we say in the factory, no callbacks. Customer calls in, somebody's got to answer that phone. We still have a receptionist, does other things, but it doesn't go to a voicemail. We want that personal service. We say, if a phone rings more than twice, somebody's picking it up. And it'll probably be me or somebody else. We, somebody will pick up that phone. How do you like it when you call somebody and rings and rings and rings? Or you get transferred three different places. We all hate it. Uh, we talk about, we're all consumers. And we talk about this all the time in the factory. Is that we're consumers and we go to Best Buy. We bring home a new DVD player, and it's scratched. What happens? We're pissed, right? Now, it should have been perfect. The one I bought should have been perfect. I don't care about the $10 million other ones. Mine had to be perfect. That's what our customers say, too. You know, So we have to make sure all the way through the organization, people recognize that they're consumers as well. Uh, one of the things, though, the technology, the other thing that's a big problem, is technology. It's wonderful, but it's just double edge. Have you ever been in reverse bids? Anybody in supply chain, purchasing, having reverse bids, the most ugly thing in the world. It's like eBay going backwards. We just went through this. It's terrible. Okay, so you've been a supplier for 10 years, right? Moral insurance means nothing to new buyers. So you get a new buyer up there, they want to make a thing, they want a couple of percent. We just went through it literally two weeks ago. I had to step out of a meeting to lift my hat and be in. A reverse bid on a product that we've been doing for 10 years. The, cut, the buyer put out there, of course, internet, the world sees us, right? Now, we think we're special. Other people can do some of the things that we do, okay? So we believe our own stuff, but we, you know, other people are good too. We have competition. First thing is that they need to put that chip on the table is a 5% reduction. You can't even put a bid in online unless it's a 5% reduction. And the buyer's done nothing except got a 5% reduction. And then we beat each other up going down in price. And indeed, the buyer must have gotten a big bonus out because he, from our business alone, he got $100,000 in savings. It was actually $106,000 from what he got last year. Nobody in manufacturing, my business, your business, has 100 grand sitting around to give away. But now we have to look at this business and say, okay, are we making a lot of money on it, or is it gonna be that marginal income? It's gonna cover some overhead. We have to make those decisions, but that's what technology has done. It used to be the salesman with the milk route and a relationship. And then the guy who had a prettier catalog. And then all of a sudden you have a website. Well, now, you, now you have credibility. Well, now he doesn't care. The buyer doesn't care if you have a website or a milk route or a catalog. He, if you have an internet connection, you can build on this guy's business. So technology is tough for us.
but we try to use it to our advantage too. But <laughs> maybe I'll go to sleep next. <laughs> Damn that internet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Tim, for you, it's all about globalization, right? A little scary? Uh, well, it's scary, yes, but it's, uh, it's a reality. And uh, what's interesting to me is, is coming from a large multinational, like some of you uh, folks here, uh, we're, we're all over the world, and, and, uh, but, but a lot of the small New Jersey businesses, like the one that I'm in and some that I've worked in, are also global. And, um, and, and it's, uh, I think our manufacturing base is evolving a little bit, uh, to touch on what John mentioned, uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're now part of the puzzle. We're not the whole puzzle like we used to be. So um, what keeps me up at night would be thoughts about how I integrate my workforce here in New Jersey with, with, with workforces around the world as we're building components around the world. How do we, how do we leverage uh, our strengths against that so that we maintain profitability and we maintain our uh, ability to compete against our, our competitors, some of whom have just bailed out of high cost markets in Europe and just gone into Indonesia where uh, you know they're, they're paying about two bucks an hour for labor and I'm paying about 25. So um, it's, it is a challenge uh, and, and probably the three biggest areas that, that we see are, are certainly quality and control and, and separately actually. Obviously you know quality is a given these days and we have to provide the same quality uh, out of uh, China as we do out of New Jersey. And we've got some customers that just won't allow us to do that. They say it has to be built in America. We, we love those. We wish there were a lot more of them. But most of our customers, like yours, probably say, we want a low price. And uh, we don't care where it's made, uh, as long as it works. So uh, that, that's a concern. Quality, maintaining quality, standardizing quality to make sure that the people in China, the people in, in India and in the Middle East uh, understand uh, and, and can adhere to our quality concerns. We, we, we certainly have the certification issues and those are global. Um, but control, um, you know, it's easy to jump on the internet, it's easy to text, it's uh, easy to, to do all that stuff, but th there, are, there are cultural issues doing business globally and you really have to hop on a plane and you have to go, you know, press the flesh and you've got to look people in the eye. And it's really challenging. It's, it's easier for, I think, large multinationals to do this because they're, they're, they can take expats and put them there. So in my, in my city, Changchung in China, Volkswagen has a, a, a big plant and they staff it with people from Germany. I can't do that. I've got to work with people that are local. And there's a trust issue and there's a relationship issue that takes a lot of time to build those uh, on a smaller scale. So that's an issue, and I'd say finally, uh, global transportation is, is a challenge. Pricing is going up, and uh, supply is going down. Uh, as a result, it's simple economics, but the, the, the shipping companies are getting a lot harder to work with these days. Uh, they tell you what they're gonna do and where they're gonna do it, and uh, sometimes it just doesn't fit well with what you need. So, uh, and they damage it, and of course it's not their fault, and, and uh, <laughs> sorts of things like that. So. Uh, so I stay awake with all their stuff too. Right? This, this all Very illuminating, thank you. Uh, so John, you were in industry for a long time, making a lot of money, and you literally jumped off a cliff when you joined the New Jersey Manufacturing Extension Program. So my question to you is, what were you thinking? <laughs> make a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> what industry was that? Yeah. Well, actually, I never saw any money in a pile. <laughs> until I sold my business, which is absolutely true. I never, you know, even when they said you, your account said you were profitable, never really made an impact on me until I sold business. And that's actually the first time I ever saw that. But it is true, I mean, uh, you know, I, I made a choice uh, after I sold uh, my engineering co company in 2007, I went to work for GDF Suez and was making a, a very nice living as the president of part of their U.S. market. Uh, but I didn't enjoy the travel. It was one thing when I was traveling for myself, it's another thing when I was traveling for somebody else. And I really wanted to do something, this is gonna sound probably, you know, hokey or whatever. My mother, who was my biggest hero in my life, said you gotta make a positive difference every day. That was her thing. This was a lady who was widowed very young, who was a checker, 
at a local King's Market, and yet she was able to keep her home together, pay her mortgage, move forward in life. And to me, that resonates. I, I know that there's at least two other Eagle Scouts sitting on this board besides myself, and that's, again, hokey, but important to me. So by coming to the NJMEP, I found a place where maybe I can make a difference. And a difference in my state, a difference in uh, in the manufacturing that I enjoy so much. But most importantly, in going to Cliff's point, to some of the kids and so on that we're coming out with, I develop a lot of leadership programs, a lot of STEM programs, and I get very frustrated when I when I talk to people that don't want to go into technology or they want to be a gamer engineer. There's only so many games that we need, but we need a heck of a lot of ability to make products. Um, so hopefully through all this pro uh, process, be able to connect more with some of the things. And I, I sit on some of the same things that, that Cliff and Bob do, trying to put some stuff together and get people excited, not only excited about manufacturing, but engineering, the technical trades that are so important. And, and I think that truly one of the things that I want to bring to the NJMEP is I want to bring the awareness of what the value of being in this, and, and not everybody is right for college. You know, my son just graduated. He didn't want anything to do with engineering. But I watched as his class grew up, and I was either their scout leader or their coach. And I watched all these kids that had skill sets in other areas that maybe didn't need college or need college at age 18. And yet they were going. And, you know, and then I look back to the 70s when I got through and, uh, you know, there was a lot of different diversion paths. And some of those guys that went into the trades then came back and got their degrees. I think we need to focus more on what we can do and to find out that it's not so bad to be a manufacturer. You know, you can actually make, uh, make a pretty good living. Uh, and yeah, you can get rich, but you know, I'm, I'm not like these guys, you know. <laughs>